Good evening, all. Um, first, I, I want to know how many of you are from University of Toronto. I was told that there are a good number of students here from University of Toronto. Raise your hands. One, two, three. All right, we're everywhere. <laughs> it is such a pleasure to be here um, because I have been involved in the discovery of, particularly of Turkish culture and the country, thanks to our friend Azim here, for about two years now. And I want to tell you that my wife and I, who have visited Turkey and have had many other interactions with people from that part of the world, uh, we have so thoroughly enjoyed every one of our moments and, and every one of our experiences. So it is really a special joy to be here. It's like being uh, here at the family. But today, I'm not going to talk about the family. The, the theme of this, um, this conference is education. And I was asked specifically to say something about education. So let me draw your attention to something that you have written here, which has caught my eye as I arrived here. Invested education. These are powerful words. And um, I want to reflect with you together here today on the meaning of some of these, mean, meaning of what's written here, invested education. Investment, by definition, is something that you do over a long time. We invest today in, in, let's say, in property or in stock and bond and so on. So we are hoping to benefit from it down the line at some point in the future. You don't invest so that you could have a return on it tomorrow. And that's one of the ideas that I want to share with you. Let me begin. I have a short story. I promise to you I won't take long, especially if you listen to me. I will take longer if you don't listen to me. Um, I'm going to start with a story of a man I know about who was a small-scale farmer in the northern Indian state of Punjab which is also where I happen to come from. That's my native state in my native country, India. This man, he owned a small piece of land, and he had his wife and five children, four sons and a daughter, and they all were trying to eke out a living out of this tiny piece of land, essentially what we call subsistence farming. So of the one day they were working on, on the farm, and of the five children, the youngest one was, of course, the least useful on the farm. He was only about six or seven years old at that point. This is back in the 1920s. And they needed something for the little mill that they had on the farm, and this young boy was sent home to bring that. And as he's walking home, he runs into a one-room school that had just opened in the village temple. And there was one teacher, one-room school, and they were just starting. And they were distributing sweets to the kids to just attract them to the school. Um, you would know that, that it's common in, in our parts of the world, including Turkey and, and Balkans and, and Afghanistan and so on, to, for people to distribute sweets when they're celebrating something new. So this young kid was given sweets, given a book in his hand, and he forgot all about why he was sent home, and stayed there in the school, sat down there, never showed up back at the farm. In the evening, the father got home, the brothers got home. His oldest brother was about 15 years older than him. And he asked him why he never came back. And his excuse was not very, very convincing, so he got pretty serious spanking from his oldest brother. Needless to say, he didn't go to school next day. And he didn't go to school the day after and the day after. And about four or five days passed, and the teacher showed up at the door. And I'm going to cut the long story short. This teacher, who was really committed to admitting this young boy in his school, he talked the father of this young boy into letting him educate one of his children, which eventually happened. The teacher took him under his wing, 
educated him through the elementary school. He turned out to be a brilliant student, won a scholarship, went to high school, finished high school, joined India's Forestry Service as the lowest level employee in, the, in there during the British times. And then, while working hard at his job, he managed to obtain a degree in forestry. And he retired a senior level administrator in India's Forestry Service. In his life, he transformed the life of many of his relatives and people from the village, worked hard for them. His family's life was transformed. And one of the members of his family is today standing in front of you. This young man was my father. Why do I tell you that story? Because this is the story of the equalization, equalizing power of education. This is the story of the transformative power of education. And education transforms individual lives. It transforms lives of societies, li lives of communities, lives of countries, and it has transformed the world. If you think about how much transformation has happened in the world as a result of education and everything education brings after it, let me give you one of some of the examples. If you go back to the dawn of the industrial, industrial revolution back in the, in the mid to late 1700s, until that time, almost everybody who ever lived on Earth was dirt poor by today's standards. The life was pretty miserable. It was hard. It was dangerous. It was precarious. And most importantly, it was short. Let me tell you how short. We don't often think about it. At the beginning of the 20th century, century in which we were all born, at the beginning of the 20th century, the average life expectancy at birth on Earth was 31 years. Think about it. Average life expectancy in the early 1900s, about 100 years ago, 31 years. Today, it's 67 years on a global scale. We don't, let's not go that far back. Let's look at some of the recent stats on that. Life expectancy in, I'm going to mention three countries because we have a relationship to those three. Canada. Right here in Canada, life expectancy in 1960 was 71.1 years. Today, it is 81.5 years. In Turkey, another country that would be of importance to a lot of people here, in 1960, life expectancy 50.5 years. Today, it's 75.7 years. In India, the country of my birth, 1960, life expectancy 42.3 years. Today, it's 65.6 years. Look around and you will notice so many blessings that we have today. Look at how our health and longevity has improved. Our standard of living has improved. Our quality of life has improved. Our mobility has improved. How our communications, global communications, are lightning fast today. And how the structure of our societies and institutions has changed so dramatically. And so much else has improved over the past century. And all these tremendous gains that we today take for granted, they have flowed from the power of education and then research, invention, and innovation that flows from education. That is the transformative power of education. So now let us look at, for a moment, how we look at education today. And I'm going to take about three or four minutes, maybe five, to just talk about how we are take, taking the education today. And uh, Madam MPP, I'm glad you're present here because 
I want to talk about some of the government policies on education today. Not just on Ontario, I'm going to talk about broadly. I'm not picking on any particular person or any particular government. There is a lot going on in the, particularly in the post-secondary education sector today. There is, there is, it's, it's a time of tremendous change. And it's also a time of tremendous doubt. And a lot of questions are being asked. Let me give you an example that happened just yesterday. The government of British Columbia yesterday, the, the premier of British Columbia, Christy Clark, announced that they are putting more public money into preparing students for work in the province's booming reserve sector. The emphasis in this new uh, redesign of the education, of the post-secondary education in BC is going to be, the emphasis is going to be on trades training, on so-called skill training, which in my view is what the way governments talk about it, it's really trades training. That's a good thing, that's a very, very good thing. There are provinces in this country where there's a dire need for skilled workers, particularly in the trades. BC is one of them, Alberta, Saskatchewan. There is a major need for these, these uh, skills there. But it was very instructive the way this announcement was made. It was made, the announcement was made while there was a demonstration of welding by high school students. That's very important, we need welders. But, and one would say, well, this is a good thing that government is putting money into training these skilled people. The problem with this thinking is that it is being done with no incremental money into that training. What is happening is the total package of money for the post-secondary education sector will remain the same, and that means money would be diverted away from some other aspects of higher education into the skills training. Why do I think that that is a problem? It's a problem because this obsession with skills training, which is a good thing, I am not questioning it. I think it's very important to have people trained in, this, in the trades skills, but this is also spawning a very short-term thinking in our country about the, the, the importance, about the role of higher education in our nation, in our society, in our nation building. Um, education has many more dimensions than just simply talking about these job-ready skills that we talk so much about. Education is about forming well-rounded individuals. It's about teaching and learning critical thinking. It is about learning logic. It's about learning problem solving. It's about learning to function and manage in a maddeningly complex world that we live in. It is about learning collaborations. It's about learning teamwork. It's about learning to exist in that world that, is, that functions on teamwork where communication skills are absolutely critical to success of not only the individual, but of the, of the organizations and society. Now, this kind of training is not going to happen on a welding shop floor. This is going to happen in the classrooms of the universities. It's not just simply going to happen. It's not limited to training of engineers and doctors and, 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 and business graduates. It's also equally important for, to train philosophers. <coughs> Madam uh, Consul General spoke about the transformation of her own country. And a lot of that transformation is not about engineering and medicine and so on. They are important. I'm myself a scientist. I'm not denigrating the value of that. It is that, that societal transformation is done also by social scientists, by humanists, by artists, by, by scholars who actually question status quo and, and as has been done in your country, for example. So why am I saying there is a problem? The, I'm saying there is a problem because I actually believe in my heart that people who can constantly talk about 
skills training, skills training, skills training, and job readiness, job readiness, and job readiness. In fact, I believe in my heart they know better. They know the value of a balance in education. Education has to be a balanced ecosystem where you need people who can, who can practice trades at a high level of skills, who can help us, help us develop our natural resources, who can help us uh, you know, with, with our industrial production and so on and so forth. But you also need those innovators, those inventors and entrepreneurs who build those industries, who build those paradigms that actually create employment for people who work on the production line with high levels of skill. And that's what we need. We need, I do believe that our leadership in this country actually knows about this. But for political expediency, we often talk too much about job readiness and we don't talk enough about innovation. We don't talk enough about invention. We don't talk enough about renewal. We don't talk about uh, enough about moving the frontiers of knowledge. And moving those frontiers of knowledge has often long-term uh, goals. They pay off over long period, just like invested education does. I will leave you with an example. Example of the Milken, the, the Nobel laureate who, who gave the world the theory of electromagnetism. So At that time, in 1923, when he won the Nobel Prize, or before that, he, when he came up with these theories, we could probably have never told what the practical importance of his discoveries was. Today, if you look at the industries that are based on electromagnetism and everything that has evolved from that, the value of the companies alone that are based on that in the world would exceed the value of all the companies that are listed on London Stock Exchange that goes into trillions of dollars. That's long-term investment. So to the youth, as you are contemplating your future, by all means, look at near-term goals. You need to get a job. Otherwise, you would not be very happy in life if you don't have a job. No, you know, no starving philosopher has ever, has ever been a happy philosopher. However, also take, take the long view. Many of you are exceptional. You're exceptionally endowed in your thinking. You're exceptionally endowed in the, in the capacity you have for innovation. And the world we are moving into is going to be an extremely complex world, even more complex than what we can imagine today. And in that world, for our human race to survive and thrive, and particularly this country to remain competitive and prosperous, we are going to need those innovators we're going to need those inventors, and we're going to need those, those um, entrepreneurs to, to, to take our society to that long-term future that I speak about. Thank you very much for your attention. I really appreciate that you listen to me quietly.